Good afternoon. Uh, good morning. Good evening, everyone, uh, depending on where you are. I'm Dr. Orbeck from Boston Children's Hospital, and joining me are Jennifer Judge and Christopher Isabor, our fantastic cerebrovascular MPs. And what we'd like to do today is to give a brief overview and educational webinar uh, for our parents and families on vein of Galen malformation. I'm going to briefly describe what the malformation is, what the state of the art current treatment is. Christopher and Jen are going to briefly go through how we manage vein of Galen patients uh, after birth until the first uh, treatment occurs. And then I'm going to go into some of the uh, points where our treatment is not optimal today, where there's room for improvement, and talk about a completely new kind of approach uh, based on a research trial that we're doing to see if we can offer a better care than is currently available. There will be Q&A, so please feel free to type in questions during the talk uh, into the Q&A box, and we will field all the questions at the very end. So let me, with that, let me get started. And here's the topic of the day. So let me just jump right in with a very brief description of what the vein of Galen malformation is. And these are just some slides showing the development in the embryo of the malformation. And early in uh, development, the, there is a dominant vein along the back of the brain called the dorsal vein of the prosencephalon, the median vein of the prosencephalon. You might see it called the Markowski vein sometimes. And this is only present very early in development. And what typically happens is that the front of this vein first uh, takes on this network-like nature and then disappears. And the back of it is actually what becomes the vein of Galen, the true vein of Galen. And these two bumps that you see over here are what are going to become the cerebral hemispheres of the brain. So early on, this is the dominant vein of the brain, the prosencephalic vein of Markowski. It actually should disappear by week 11. But what happens in babies with vein of Galen malformation is that this vein never disappears. And instead, arteriovenous connections form from the early arteries in the brain to this very vein and the vein, instead of disappearing, balloons up and grows. And this is now a sideways view of the same thing. So this is that median vein of Markowski here that grows and grows and grows because there's high arterial flow going into it. So what we call a vein of Galen malformation is actually a malformation involving this Markowski vein. And a true vein of Galen is, is not involved in these patients. But this is the vein of Galen malformation. This condition used to be nearly universally fatal years ago, but there's a current paradigm for treating this condition, which was developed in the late 1980s and early 1990s, primarily in Paris uh, by Pierre Lachionias and his colleagues, um, Alex Berenstein and Karel Terbrook. And that paradigm is some version of it is used at most high volume centers to this very day. And let me just show you what that looks like these days. So currently, most times the malformation is picked up during development on surveillance ultrasound, and this is an actual patient of ours from several years ago. You can see that typical ultrasound um, makes it very hard to actually see the malformation. So these two images are from the very same patient. This one has the color Doppler on, so you can see the high flow. And of course, it lights up like a light bulb in here. You can't miss it. But Turning on the Doppler is not something that's typically done for surveillance ultrasound, and you can see that it can be quite difficult to see the vein of Galen malformation. But if and when it is seen on ultrasound, the next step is then a fetal MRI scan. And this is, again, that same patient from a few years back. So here's the fetal MRI in two different views. This is that big Markowski vein that I talked about before. So this is the dominant vein that's getting all the arteries flowing into it. I would say the main goal of the fetal ultrasound at this stage is actually to look at the brain tissue and to assess what the health of the brain tissue is, because sometimes the babies can develop brain injuries even during pregnancy before birth, although that's quite rare, it can happen. And we wanna know what the state of the brain is before uh, coming up with a treatment plan and recommendation. And then Jan and Christopher are going to describe specifically what happens after birth, but before that, I'll just show you some images. This is again that same patient. This is the MRI scan we get right after birth, and we get a much better view of the malformation, its structure. You can see that in this case, there's a single dominant artery over here that comes into that vein, and that's going to be a technical challenge for treatment. 
We can look at the brain tissue in even more detail and see that the brain tissue in this case was excellent. And then depending on how sick the baby is after birth, we time embolization, which is the actual treatment for the vein of Galen malformation. And the goal of treatment is to disconnect those high flow um, arteries, high pressure arteries from the vein. So in this particular case, you can see there's literally a single hole in the vein over here with all of the arteries converging onto one point and coming into the vein right here. So the technical challenge is to close exactly at this point. And there are different ways to approach that technically. In this case, I put a small nest of coils in front of my microcatheter here first, just to slow the flow at first. And then that allowed me to inject glue in a very controlled manner, as you can see here. And the net effect you can see on the next slide. So there's now complete disconnection between the arteries and the vein is no longer showing up anymore. So the arteries are now providing blood to the brain tissue as they should, no longer supplying blood to the, to the vein at all. So that vein has been taken out of the circulation. This is a normal blush of the brain tissue showing the brain taking up the blood. And here you can see the effect on this patient. So these, these are all the same patient. This is the fetal MRI scan. This is the MRI scan from the NICU after the baby was born. And then this is at age two years. This patient is now actually about 13 years old. But you can see that what's happened over time is that that big vein actually disappeared entirely. So in cases where we can close all of the flow into the malformation, this is what happens. The vein can actually uh, shrink completely over time. And you can see the brain looks completely intact. I'll just show one more case to show you the variety of what the shape of the malformation can be. They do not often have that shape I showed you of one single pipe going into the big vein. In this case, it's a much more complex tangle of many, many arterial feeders coming into the side of the vein here. These are a front view and these are a sideways view of the same thing. And you can see many, many tiny little arteries coming into that vein. Here's the vein and here's the drainage of the vein. So the approach needs to be technically different here. In this case, this was pure glue. And you can see the tip of my microcatheter here showing only the arteries feeding the malformation. There's no brain tissue being fed here. This is again, the frontal view and the sideways view. These are now glue casts that you can see in the frontal view and in the sideways view. Again, disconnecting the arteries from that vein. And the effect is the same. So after the embolization, you can now see the injection of contrast shows only the normal arteries of the brain, only the normal brain blush, and that big vein is not showing up anymore. Same thing here in the sideways view. And the net effect for the patient is exactly the same. So here's um, the initial at the MRI scan at four months before treatment. Here's that big vein with the arterial inflow. Oops, and here's the patient at two and a half years, and you can see that the big vein has completely disappeared and the brain is intact. So that's best case scenario, how uh, the outcome can be for babies with vein of Galen malformation treated uh, either right after birth or in the first few months of life. And I'm going to pass the baton now to Jen and Christopher to go through how we manage um, our patients at Boston. I would say not every hospital has the exact same protocol, but they're all some related version of what Jen and Christopher are about to, to describe to you. So um, here at Boston Children's Hospital, typically uh, we have a joint appointment uh, with a, a, the family as well as our fetal team, where we go over imaging with Dr. Allback as well as the um, GY and OB team. We review the fetal imaging, including the MRI and the echo. Um, they, the family is able to meet with the neurointerventional radiology team. Again, that would be Dr. Allback, myself, and Jen, as well as our neuro, neurology team and cardiology team. So it's a multidisciplinary meeting with the family. Uh, we discuss the delivery at the Brigham and Women's. Um, uh, a discussion entails uh, reviewing the diagnosis itself, uh, potential outcomes, uh, the treatment plans, as well as delivery and NICU stay after delivery. Uh, for the most part, uh, we uh, try to have delivery done at, at Brigham and Women's Hospital and keep the babies there, except if there, there is a, an urgent um, intervention that needs to be uh, done in an ASAP fashion to get transferred over to us. Um, so again, this slide just uh, in detail go into what I just mentioned. So delivery is planned at Brigham and Women's Hospital. This could be either vaginal or C-section. 
uh, once the baby is born, the admission is done, uh, will be to the NICU. Um, typically, Dr. Allback would recommend placing a UA line and a UV line. And the reason for that is just in case we need to make urgent um, um, intervention in the form of mobilization of the uh, vein of Galen. Uh, we try to keep them NPO right after birth, um, then get detailed imaging postnatally uh, in the form of an MRI, MRA, and then South Sudan and get an echo as well. So once the baby's born and they're admitted to the um, Brigham and Women's Hospital NICU, uh, we'll monitor for signs of heart failure, um, including pulmonary hypertension um, and left-sided heart failure. If um, the babies go into heart failure and they're unable to be medically managed uh, by the cardiology team, um, that is when we would consider um, an early intervention. Um, if all goes well and the baby um, continues to not require intubation and um, they're uh, usually at three days after birth, we can usually talk about starting to begin feeding the baby and look toward a discharge home rather than an urgent intervention. Um, prior to our discharge, we would obtain a baseline head ultrasound, um, which can be a comparison for the head ultrasounds to follow. Um, if an urgent embolization is required, uh, then the baby would be transferred over to uh, the Boston Children's Hospital NICU. Um, typically, uh, more than one procedure would be needed, um, and there is limits on how much we can do at each one time due to the limits on the contrast um, and the changes in the blood flow. Um, embolization will be repeated until the pulmonary hypertension or left-sided heart failure shows clear improvement um, and the baby's on a path toward extubation. Um, other than the cardiopulmonary indications, um, severe progressive brain injuries are another potential reason to proceed with early intubation. Uh, I'm sorry, early embolization. If, uh, if the babies are able to uh, be discharged from the NICU, uh, we will plan to follow them uh, with every other week head ultrasounds alternating with their PCP appointments um, for a fontanelle check as well as a head circumference and developmental assessment. We'll usually plan to repeat an MRI between three and six months and then discuss an embolization um, here in Boston. Um, and we'll continue to bring them back um, as needed uh, for uh, further embolizations and discuss more imaging uh, after that. So I'll hand it back to Dr. Warbeck at this point. Okay, so just to summarize that, um, as I said early on, before modern embolization techniques were developed, vein of Galen malformation was almost universally fatal. Um, and the techniques we now have, which as I said, are, are about 30, 35 years old now, really have transformed the condition to a state where at, at all the high volume centers, we have many patients who do extraordinarily well, and that's been fantastic. Um, but in the last few years, there's been increased attention paid to how are we actually doing overall in treating all uh, fetuses with vein of Galen malformation and all children who are born with vein of Galen malformation. And there's been, I think, more of an honest assessment than was done, than was present in the early literature. And that's what I'd like to go through now. So I'm going to step out and really try to discuss some of the recent research with all of you and talk about where our deficiencies are and where we're not able to provide adequate care and then show you the motivation for why we're trying to think outside the box and develop a new set of techniques. So the first thing I wanna say is that this management of the newborns is extremely difficult. And I, I just wanna show you that through this, what I think is a very honest paper that was published last year in JAMA Neurology. And this came out of Toronto Sick Kids Hospital, which is a major international referral center for vein of Galen malformation. In fact, Karel Terbrug, who's the senior neurointerventionalist there, really developed some of these, er, of these embolization techniques we now use along with Pierre Lajonias and Alex Berenstein. So a very experienced and highly skilled team. And they, they did an overview of their cohort of, they looked at 33 consecutive patients with vein of Galen malformation. And what they found um, somewhat surprisingly is that for the ones who underwent embolization, there, was a lot, there were a lot of complications. So about 30% of them had major morbidity and half of those 30% actually died. 
that's a 15% mortality rate. And if you compare that to most major surgical procedures that we do, this is a very high rate of morbidity and mortality. And here's another paper also uh, published last year. This is out of Lausanne, Switzerland, another experienced group. They looked at a cohort of 52 patients. In their hands, there was a mortality rate of 37%. And among the survivors, over 40% of them had severe neurologic impairment. And another thing, maybe it'll come up in the Q&A, a lot of parents are curious about the long-term effects of vein of galen malformation. Even in the 58% who did not have severe neurologic impairment, there's a fairly high incidence of some neurodevelopmental issues, whether it be seizures, learning deficits, things like that. So even at high volume skilled centers, the morbidity and mortality we're facing are still um, definitely not trivial. They're still quite high. Um, there, was a, there were two studies uh, in the last decade that came out of Europe asking an interesting question, which was if we ask from the fetus's perspective or from the perspective of the pregnant parent, at the moment you make the diagnosis, what is the chance that that fetus with the diagnosis of vein of Galen malformation will do well, will survive, and will survive past infancy without a major neurologic problem. And they found the chances when they looked at their cohorts were only about 35% chance, which again, if you look at a lot of the neurointerventional literature, it's kind of surprising. I don't think a lot of people would have come up with a number like that. And I think the best studies of all have actually come out of the UK, out of London and the Great Ormond Street Hospital, where because they have a nationalized healthcare system, they're able to look at the entire national cohort of, of fetuses with vein of Galen malformation. And what they found was that approximately two thirds of all the newborns actually run into major problems in the NICU. So they crash and develop heart failure and lung failure. They require high risk embolization. So I'm going to refer to that group as the neonatal at risk group. And it's again, it's about two thirds of all the fetuses with vein of Galen malformation, the ones who really run into trouble right away. That's about the same as our numbers. We find that about two thirds of the newborns we see here also run into trouble. And what they reported out of London is that in that group, and they're also a very high volume, highly skilled group of, of physicians treating this, they reported about a 40% mortality. And of the survivors, about 50% of them had severe neurocognitive issues um, as a result of all this. So if you put all those numbers together for this cohort that runs into trouble in the NICU, there's only about a 30% likelihood that they survive to adulthood without significant neurologic injury. How about the other group, the, the one third remaining babies who are born and they get out of the NICU fine and they don't have problems in the NICU? There, of course, the survival rate is much better. So the survival, uh, again, this is the London group reporting, was about 90%. But even in that group, there was about a 30% incidence of poor neurologic outcome, despite the fact that they were treated at this excellent center. So I'm going to call this group the infantile treatment group, IT. So we have the NAR group that crashes in the NICU, about two thirds of all the babies born with a high mortality and morbidity. And we have the IT group, which does better in the NICU, get discharged and they're brought back for elective treatment. And I, I'll just show you a few images. I know you're, you're all not radiologists, but I'll just show you a few images to show you the kinds of brain injuries that we can see in this NAR group. So this was a patient who was referred to us. This was an MRI scan on day three after birth. And you don't have to be a radiologist to compare. This is the right hemisphere, and this is the left hemisphere, and this is normal brain tissue here. And you can see that the entire left hemisphere has been injured, and it almost has the same signal as the cerebrospinal fluid. So this is a huge injury to the left hemisphere all the way down here. Before any treatment, this is just a referral from another hospital already on day three of life. Um, this is uh, another dramatic case from a few years back referred to us. So this baby was born out of town. This is the initial MRI scan on day one after birth. And there actually are already some brain injuries seen here, but you can see that both hemispheres are still present on both sides. So you can see a large vein of Galen malformation. You can see the gray brain tissue here in both hemispheres. The baby was airlifted to us and the transfer took a few days. And before we undertook any treatment at all, we decided to get another scan and look what we found before any treatment, both hemispheres with huge injuries really affecting the entirety of both hemispheres. And honestly, I don't think there's anything we could have done even if we started treating at the moment this baby was born 
to prevent this. This is such a widespread cascade of injury. I don't think that's possible to stop. So if we're honest and we ask ourselves, how are we really doing in managing this condition? I think we'd have to say that from the perspective of the pregnant parents, really the chances of a tragic outcome outweigh chances of all other outcomes, despite all the progress that we've made. And that raises the question of, should we be trying to intervene before birth? Um, so the challenge, of course, the first challenge is, can we identify the right group to target for these fetal intervention? Now, I mentioned to you that there are two thirds of the babies will crash in the NICU and will have um, that very tough morbidity and mortality, but the remaining third will do well. And we definitely do not wanna target that remaining third. So we need to be able to predict based on fetal MRI scans, how the baby will do after birth. And it turns out we actually can do that. Um, so we recently looked at this question and collected all of our fetal MRI scans and we measured basically everything you can measure of, on the vessels involved in the vein of Galen malformation. And we asked for each thing, each parameter that we measured, what is the likelihood that that baby would go on to crash in the NICU? And we found that a particular measurement, which was the width of the sinus, the venous sinus that drains the malformation. If you find the spot to measure and then you measure the width, the wider that width is, the likelier that baby will, will do badly in the NICU. And so this shows you actually the width of that sinus as you go up, and this shows you the probability that that baby is going to be one of the NAR babies after birth. By the time you get to an eight millimeter width of that sinus, there's almost a 90% chance that that baby is going to um, be in that NAR group in the NICU and need the urgent embolization, have the high morbidity and high mortality. So that means if we're looking at a fetal scan and we see very wide sinuses, we know with almost near certainty that the baby is going to do badly in the NICU. If we look at a fetal scan and we see very narrow sinuses, we're quite confident the baby will do well. There is definitely an intermediate group where the sinus is an intermediate width and we just can't predict how the baby is going to do. So we are limiting the fetal intervention to those eight millimeters or larger where we are nearly certain that the baby is going to have a tough time in the NICU. And then the next question is, what can we do? And I won't go into all the details, but I'll just say that we have an active fetal interventional cardiology program here at the hospital where there are needle guided treatments that are done where a needle is put through the uterus, um, the mom gets spinal anesthesia and a needle is introduced similar to an amniocentesis. And then it actually is introduced right into the fetal heart to correct cardiac abnormalities that would not be compatible with life. So for example, if the aortic valve, one of the valves in the heart is too narrow, they can do a balloon dilatation of that valve in the fetus and allow the ventricles of the heart to grow normally and the baby to survive. And I'll just show you a few slides from that. So this is an actual fetal cardiac intervention. This is the needle coming into the buttock of the baby for injection of anesthetic and paralytic. And this is another slide from a fetal cardiac intervention, you can see the beating heart. And this is actually the wire going through the aortic valve, which is too narrow here. And they can then do a balloon dilatation to allow that valve to be a normal size and allow the heart to develop normally. By analogy, um, what the trial, our trial is designed to do is to introduce a needle through the mother's, through the uterus and right through the soft spot in the back of the skull into the collection of sinuses in the back of the brain and then a microcatheter is directed towards the big vein where coils are deployed um, to dramatically slow the flow through the malformation. And the goal is not to close the malformation, but just to dramatically decrease the flow. And the goal is to convert the fetuses who would be NAR fetuses, the, fet the babies who would run into trouble in the NICU to convert them into IT patients who hopefully can get discharged from the NICU. Um, we actually developed a simulation of the fetal brain. We had our simulation group at the hospital build a model of a fetal brain based on actual patients of ours with an inside um, um, sort of vein that they designed with the draining sinus. And here's the artificial skull. And, my, and we did a pre-planning MRI scan of the phantom. And then you can see my colleague's hands here are directing the, the needle under ultrasound. And then I put a, a catheter and wire in here all under ultrasound. And here are just a few images showing um, what the coiling process looks like in these fetal phantoms. So, um, and, and then we, after that, we did 
uh, post-treatment MRI scan to verify that the coils were in fact deployed exactly where they're supposed to be. And then you can see when we open the phantom up, the coils were deployed exactly at the target where they're supposed to be. So we put this packet together and we submitted it to the FDA and the IRB, the, or the oversight board of the hospital at Brigham and Women's and Children's. And we do have approval now for a formal clinical trial of this approach. So again, the idea is to identify fetuses who are almost certainly going to run into trouble in the NICU, have high morbidity and mortality if we treat them using the current state of the art and try this fetal intervention to see if we can improve their outcome. This is science, so this is a clinical trial of research. We don't know that this is safe or effective, but, um, but this is uh, what the trial is trying to answer. So just to summarize everything we talked about, and then we'll, we'll have time for some Q&A, we saw that vein of Galen malformation is a very complex uh, congenital vascular malformation of the brain. The numbers of how often it occurs are a little bit all over the place in the literature. I would estimate it's about one in 30,000 pregnancies. Um, we saw that the treatment is extremely challenging, requires multidisciplinary expertise. It really should be done at specialized high volume centers. We saw that unfortunately, even at, at these centers of expertise, the mortality and the morbidity really remain major challenges even today. I showed you that we've developed a new needle guided procedure for fetal embolization. And the goal is to transform the fetus from one that will run into trouble in the NICU to one that will hopefully be able to be discharged from the NICU. And we're running a formal clinical trial to, to assess this approach. Uh, I would ask if a, if a family reaches out to you with a fetal diagnosis, please consider telling them about the trial. As I said, we do have very strict criteria for including patients. We will not offer this to patients who have a low risk pregnancy with vein of Galen malformation where we think the baby is likely to do well in the NICU. And I'll just mention there's no cost to the patient to be treated in the trial. There's no procedural cost. There's no hospitalization cost. It's all covered by, by research funds. Um, here is the contact information for our maternal fetal care center, the phone number and the email. And this is my uh, phone number and email here. And with that, I'm going to stop and we'll have time for Q&A. Okay, um, so uh, Dr. Orbeck, I have um, some questions for you. Um, first question is, is um, my daughter was born at 39 weeks, only lived for 14 hours. Um, they said her vein of Galen, um, which was detected at 33 weeks, was too severe to treat, and um, she only received palliative care. How common is uh, the untreatable too severe in vein of Galen statistically? Yeah. So um, I don't think anyone has a hard number on how what fraction of all the vein of Galen babies are affected that severely. Um, but I will say it is rare. And in it, to answer the question of, of why the case would be too rare to treat, I showed you some images of the MRI scans after birth with major brain injuries a few, within a few days after birth. Sometimes in some cases, we see those kind of brain injuries even before birth. So on the fetal MRI scan, we see major brain injuries. Unfortunately, in cases like that, we just cannot offer treatment because no matter what we do, that baby is not going to survive. And the very few who do manage to survive are extremely severely impacted. It's usually a life of being bed bound with constant seizures and, and really no ability to interact. So if we see brain injuries on the fetal MRI scan, almost no center would, would offer aggressive treatment, um, I will say that. We're actually doing a research study right now that's almost ready for publication, asking the question, if you start seeing fetal brain injuries, even if they're not very widespread yet, does that necessarily mean that that's a cascade that goes on to progress? And the, sh the short answer is it looks like it might. If once you start getting the brain injuries in utero, that might be an irreversible process. So we definitely want to intervene before that happens. And I obviously don't, don't know uh, your specific case, but I assume that the doctors um, in Sweden, that's what they saw on the, on the fetal MRI scan. And that's why they thought it was too severe to treat. Um, there's another question. I think I, think I can take this one, but um, Dr. Orbe can chime in. Um, it's uh, long-term, what can vein of Galen patients not do? Um, it, you know, it depends on how your specific child is doing, but 
ultimately our goal is for our patients to live as normal life as possible. So we generally don't have very many restrictions. Um, as in with all of our patients, regardless of the diagnosis, we generally restrict against things like, or recommend against things like contact football and boxing. But otherwise we let our children do most things that whatever they physically can do, we want them to be able to do. And uh, our next question is, um, a family lost their uh, Vanny Galen baby in 2017. Um, what are the chances or likelihood of it happening to another child? That's a very good question. Lots of families ask about that. Um, and, and I think the answer to that is probably um, changing in real time based on research that's being done. So in, in the old days, we used to say that this malformation is um, was just an accident of development that, that happened for some accidental reason. But in the last, really very recently, in the last five years, there's been an explosion of research on the genetics of vein of Galen malformation. And um, there's been several international collaborations collecting um, blood and saliva from families and patients and, and parents uh, with vein of Galen malformation. And um, we have uncovered a range of genetic mutations that seem to be associated with vein of Galen malformation. Some of our patients have participated in those studies. I will say that even in families where there is one of those mutations, even so, the chance of having another child with a vein of Galen malformation are extraordinarily low. I, I used to tell families that I had never seen or heard of such a case where in a single family there was more than one diagnosis. But there, there actually are, I think, two cases in the literature now where someone reported that um, there was a baby who had a vein of Galen malformation with a mutation, and then it's either a second pregnancy or a second child was born with a vein of Galen. I have never seen one. And I, I, again, it's extraordinarily rare, even if you do carry the mutation, um, but, but it's not impossible. Our next question is uh, with the fetal intervention, um, what week of pregnancy would you intervene? Uh, that's a very good question. So right now we're keeping the window wide open and we're basing it largely on our experience with the fetal cardiac interventions. Um, so we've been doing the fetal cardiac interventions for, for 50, over 15 years now. So there's a lot of experience of the multidisciplinary team and there are both maternal and fetal factors that make it safe to intervene. So I would say the earliest we would do it would be as early as the vein of Galen malformation is detected. And I will tell you that it's really never detected before week 22. Um, and interestingly, if you, were, if you were paying attention to the talk, I mentioned that we think the malformation forms very early in, fe in fetal life before week 11, actually, in the first trimester. And the reason we think that is that median vein of the presencephalon, the Markowski vein that I showed you, normally goes away entirely by week 11. So if there's a malformation that involves that vein, it must have formed before week 11 when the Markowski vein was still around. But even though the malformation forms so early on, it's just never seen on any imaging that's done before week 22. I think the earliest report in the literature is the end of week 21 or early week 22. And our earliest cases are week 22, week 23. So, so in real life, that would be the earliest end of when we could possibly offer this. The latest end of when we could offer it really would be based on our, um, our MFM's experience with the cardiac interventions. Once you get very close to term, it becomes increasingly difficult to try to position the baby well for a fetal intervention. And if, you, if the baby's too big to position well, it's just impossible to do, uh, and it's impossible to do safely. So that would really be the, the call of the, the OB, the MFM, you know, the high-risk MFM would be involved in the project. From a research perspective, we've left the window wide open. So anytime that we think it's possible to do, we would do it. It may definitely be that there is an optimal time to do this, Kind of fetal intervention. We have no idea when that might be, though, because it's a brand new procedure. So that's one of the things we'll be looking at closely during the course of the trial. Um, our next question. Um, my 11 month old is currently being treated. Um, what is the risk of brain damage now? Um, 
So I'm not sure if the question is about damage from the treatment or from the procedure, but I, I'll address both of them. Um, you know, we always tell patients that there is unavoidable risk from any intervention. And you saw the numbers that I showed from the paper from Toronto and from Switzerland. Uh, there's just unavoidable risk of bleeding and hemorrhage anytime any intervention is done in the brain, really, on, on the, a blood vessel abnormality. The risk of, of um, in, of brain injury from the malformation itself really depends on how much flow there is and on the particular case. Has there been any prior brain injury or not? Usually the order of challenges that the babies face is the first major challenge is to the heart, to heart function and heart failure after birth. That rarely becomes an issue after the early neonatal period. So if you've made it past the first month or two, of life and there are really no cardiac issues, it would be unusual for cardiac issues to become an issue, but brain injuries can definitely become an issue in the first few months of life after that. I would say out to a year, beyond a year. So um, as long as there's malformation that still has relatively high flow, there is some risk of having brain injuries. That risk likely goes away over time though, by the time you get to two years, three years, but honestly, there's a lot that we don't know about the longer term prognosis of this condition. And uh, all of us in the community who treat um, patients with this are, are going to be following these kids as they grow up just to answer exactly these kinds of questions. Um, I think this next question is pretty similar. Um, the side effects of an embolization. Yeah, so that's similar to what, um, what I talked about before. There, there's an unavoidable risk of bleeding and stroke um, that's really unavoidable. There are particular risks that come with treating newborns. And I, I showed you those very tough numbers that newborns face when they need treatment from the NICU. So there can be risks to the femoral arteries in the legs, the, the arteries that we use. If you, uh, Christopher mentioned that we put an umbilical artery line in to the newborns who are born here so that we can use that pathway for embolization. But, um, but if that's not done, and at some centers it's not, if you have to use the femoral arteries, there is a risk to those arteries because even our smallest catheters are about the size of the femoral artery, depending on the size of the newborn. So there's some risk that those arteries may shut down, which can cause risk to the leg. Um, or it can cause the risk of not being able to get back in if you have if you've lost both femoral uh, artery access, you may have to do some other type of intervention to get access. But, but those are the main risks. Okay, so the next question, um, if a child is cured while doing well post embolization, is the is their life expectancy any different than a child without a venogale malformation diagnosis? That's a great question. I wish I had the information to answer it fully. Um, the one thing I will say is I actually never use the word cured. Um, and I know patients love and families love to hear the word cured and we can make it so the picture looks perfect. So I showed you those cases at the beginning where you can close the, in some cases you can close the malformation 100% and you just don't see any sign of it on your images. I don't think that necessarily reflects the biology on, that's underlying there. And so we continue doing surveillance scans. I think that we have to be honest with families and patients and say that we just don't know. Um, and so if someone, you know, even into adulthood, I would say there's some role for surveillance scanning just to make sure that nothing recurs. In terms of long-term, uh, you know, lifespan and, and, and quality of life, as I mentioned, these techniques were really only developed in the late 80s and early 1990s. And most of the babies before those techniques were developed actually passed away. So that means the first patients who were treated with these techniques are only about 30 years old now, you know, 35 years old. And so we just honestly don't know what happens when you hit middle age and when they become elderly. Every once in a blue moon, you will see an elderly person who had an undiagnosed vein of Galen malformation that must have been extremely mild and they may come in with a brain hemorrhage in, in, as an elderly person. We had one here in Boston a few years back. It's extraordinarily rare, and, and we just don't know what happens to most patients um, very long-term. So that's, those are all important questions that we will be following over the coming years. Do you have numbers on average number of embolizations needed to close the malformation 
from your uh, all corridor and malformations? Um, I, I don't have an, you know, if you asked me to guess, I would guess the average works out to probably something like 3.5 across all patients. But I don't think the average is a very meaningful number because some patients, I showed you two kinds of patients in the two cases that I showed. If there's a single hole fistula type of uh, structure of the malformation where there's one hole in the vein with all the inflow going into it, there actually is no way to treat that in more than one session. Your treatment is going to be the treatment because you close that inflow and that's it. There's, no, there's nothing else that you could possibly treat for that child. On the other hand, some kids have hundreds of arteries going into that vein and you have to do a staged embolization of multiple, multiple procedures. Um, you know, is there a point at which you stop? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. In our practice here, my approach is I try to embolize all of what look like safe vessels for me to treat. Um, there's no, as I said, there's no embolization that's 100% risk-free, but you can often approximate what the risk is. And once we've treated all of the lower risk arterial inflow, there are definitely many cases where the remaining vessels are also supplying brain structures like the thalamus or other central gray nuclei of the brain that are very, very central to neurologic function and treating them would be high risk. So we, we would stop at that point. Um, so so I, I just don't think the average is a super meaningful number and it really is very uh, personalized based on the individual case. Um, the next question is, um, my son Vanny Galen was not discovered until he was born, um, and this was back in January of 2016. Um, Owen was born in Rochester and then transferred here to Boston, uh, but his case was too severe for treatment and passed away at eight days. Um, at that time, the doctors had limited knowledge um, of, about this condition, um, and we struggled to find information. Since that point, there seems to be more higher numbers of cases discovered as well as more awareness of the cases. Um, two questions, why do you think that is? And number two, in the cases of Vanny Galen, how many seem to be related to genetics versus bad luck? Hmm. Um, I would agree that there is more awareness. Um, why that is, is an interesting question. I, I think it probably is related to the internet and social media and people just have access to a, a whole world of things they didn't really before. I think that um, those kinds of tools have really changed medical practice in general. So, you know, in the old days, patients depended on the particular physician they were seeing to learn about um, a topic or they might get a referral to another physician in town, or, or maybe they would travel somewhere to, you know, to, to get another second, a third opinion. But really, they didn't have ready tools available, and support groups were much more difficult to organize, you know, if you have to do it in your local town or things like that. Um, so I think there's just more awareness across the board for any medical condition. Patients now come in quite educated. They've often spoken to other families who have the same condition. They've, they've read about multiple centers treating this. So that's what, how I would explain the awareness. Um, in terms of the genetics versus the bad luck, as I said, we used to say it's just an accident of development. I, I don't think that's true anymore. Um, there have been, to, to date, um, four or five mutations described with vein of Galen that are associated with vein of Galen malformation. It's just an association, which means that a lot of kids with those mutations don't have a vein of Galen malformation. They may have a vascular malformation of a different type in the brain, or they may have a vascular malformation in their spine, or they may have an AVM of their arm or, or some other part of their body. And we don't yet understand why the same mutation can cause these different effects in different parts of the body. But even taking all of those mutations together, that's still just a minority of all the kids with vein of Galen malformation. I don't think that means that the other kids necessarily don't have a mutation. It just means these are the early days in that research and we have a lot more to discover. So there, there are a bunch of groups now searching for new mutations and it may very well be that um, when the science is better developed, most kids with this condition will be found to have uh, a mutation. I just want to add one thing about mutations in general, just to clarify, there are two general types of mutations that you can have. One is the kind of genetic mutation that people 
think of when you, in general, when you're talking casually about a genetic mutation, which means your parents had a genetic mutation and it's passed down to you and every one of their children has some likelihood of either getting that mutation or not, depending on which copy of the gene they inherit. That's one kind of mutation. The other kind of mutation is a spontaneous mutation that happens in the embryo. So there's no genetic mutation that was, that was carried on from the parents, but one of the cells of the embryo itself develops a spontaneous mutation. And at that point, the daughter cells from that particular cell have the mutation, but the other cells in the embryo do not have that mutation. That's a different kind of mutation. It's called a somatic mutation. And the important thing about that is that depending on where, which cell that mutation occurred in, that determines which part of the body will be affected. So for example, not with vein of Galen malformation, because we don't have that kind of information yet, but for a related condition called a brain AVM, it has been shown that many patients with brain AVM have this kind of somatic mutation where just the blood vessels involved in the AVM and that particular part of the brain carry the mutation. But if you just did a blood test or you, you took saliva or some other uh, tissue from the patient, you would not find the mutation. It also means that the patient will not pass on the mutation to their own children. So it's a specific mutation in just part of the body that's affected. And it's almost certainly gonna be the case that vein of Galen malformation involves both of those kind of mutations. Maybe in fact, you need both to actually have the condition. You need to inherit something from your parents, but alone it's not enough to cause the condition to, to present. But then you have a second, called the second hit hypothesis that affects the blood vessels of the brain. And now all of a sudden, um, all of a sudden you, you have this, this malformation. Another question here. For kids diagnosed after the newborn phase, uh, six months plus, what are their chances of neurological issues? So uh, there's no question that the highest risk for having a neurologic issue is if you have brain injury seen on the MRI scan at any point. So um, if, if there's some brain injury that occurred either pre-delivery or early on or at any point, then the chance of having either um, some constant neurologic symptom or seizures or something is definitely higher. But it is also certainly possible that the brain tissue may look completely intact on the scan and the patient may still have one of these issues. I, I showed you that study from, from Lausanne, Switzerland, where they found that even the babies who did very well, who did not have severe issues and who had good looking MRI scans do have a high incidence of some neurologic issues. To put a number on that, I don't think the research is really out there yet. I, I, I just brought you up to date on the very latest research. So you've now seen the new papers that are out and they're all based on still relatively small groups of you know, 50 patients here, 30 patients there. We just don't have data yet from hundreds and hundreds of patients to be able to give you a, a firm number on that. But as a general rule, I would say, if there's some brain injury seen on the scan, the risk is certainly much higher. If there's no brain injury on the scan, there's a very good chance of not having any issues, but there certainly um, can, be, can be issues as well. Um, I think the next one I can answer. Um, how important is it um, to see a vein of Galen specialist versus staying locally for treatment? Um, the doctor has only treated a few vein of Galen children, if any. Um, you know, we always suggest to our patients that they should um, be seen at a high volume center by someone who treats these a lot. I know they're, and, you know, it's still a rare condition and nobody treats thousands and thousands, but um, it is important to go to a high volume center and get at least get an opinion from a high volume doctor um, because, you know, the embolizations are risky and, um, you know, you want to do it in skilled hands. I don't know, Dr. Orbeck, do you have any other? Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with what Jen just said. Um, I think that getting um, second and third opinions is great. I actually strongly urge um, patients who see us to do that. But the one thing I strongly urge families is to go to high volume centers. We've seen lots of cases with just tragic outcomes when a patient is treated at a center that doesn't see these. And because they're rare, most even very busy neurointerventionalists are almost always treating adults 95% of the time. 
when they treat a child, it's either there's trauma or, or, or an aneurysm or something like that. But to treat vein of Galen malformation is extremely technically challenging. It requires an expert team, not just the, the interventionalist. It requires um, you know, the MPs. It requires a fetal care center. It requires pediatric anesthesia, um, neurology. The ICU care is very central. And there, there are just a, a few centers that see it regularly. So I strongly urge families to look for those centers and get their, their opinions and their treatment there. Another question here. Um, how often uh, will vein of Gillum children need to have MRIs to monitor their malformation as they grow or even into adulthood? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's a little bit, we all play it by ear these days. So our practices, when we try to do as much treatment uh, early on in the first year or so after, um, after birth and try to close as much as we can close safely in infancy. But then we do follow our patients with scans. If the scan looks completely unchanged, let's say after a year for several years in a row, we'll then go to every two years or every three years. And then we'll, we continue following our patients you know, into their teenage years uh, and beyond. If we, when, do we, when could we stop imaging them is just a question that we honestly can't answer based on the current science. So I would recommend maybe it's going to be every three years or every five years through adulthood. Um, I think that answer will become apparent as, as time goes by and, and we follow kids with this condition, you know, really into, into mid and late adulthood. But, but honestly, we don't know the answer right now. Um, so I think we'll um, at this point answer um, one to two more questions and then um, we can wrap up. We will um, be available if you want to send questions in. We can try to respond after. Um, and I did want to make an announcement about the nonprofit organization um, at vogm.org. Um, there, there is resources to help with travel um, and grant um, and grants and other resources for for you. So if you your child has been diagnosed, feel free to reach out to that group um, and they'll be helpful. Um, here is a question. Um, how often uh, do vena Galen children develop seizures? Um, does this suggest future problems um, in the brain? And do you find the seizures stay for a long time or just during early childhood? That, that's actually a great question. Um, so again, I would say, as I mentioned before, if there's any brain injury, and this is not specific to vein of Galen malformation, if there's brain injury for any reason from trauma or a tumor or, or a stroke or anything, then, then it's quite common for children with any form of brain injury to have seizures. And they can be easily controlled or difficult to control um, if there is a brain injury. But there's no question that there can be seizures in kids with vein of Galen malformation, even if there is no brain injury. And this, I think, has been a very interesting finding from the recent genetic, in, uh, the genetic research that's been done. One of the really intriguing findings of the, the recent studies is that one of the genes that's been found to be associated with vein of Galen malformation is in a gene that, that makes something called chromatin. And chromatin has independently been found to be associated with other uh, brain and behavioral problems. So for example, there's an association between chromatin mutations and autism. And there's a mutation, there's an association between chromatin mutations and seizures. And so that means that if a vein of Galen malformation child um, has this chromatin mutation, and maybe that's associated with their vein of Galen malformation, they may be having seizures on the basis of the genetic mutation, not on the basis of the malformation. And that was certainly news to me. I mean, I think all of us who treat this condition assumed that if a child is having seizures, it means we need to treat the malformation more and we should do more and more embolization, maybe riskier and riskier embolization. That may not be the case at all. It may be that the seizures are coming from this other neurologic hit that the baby has due to this genetic mutation. 
Um, again, I don't think the, the literature is, is well developed enough to give specific numbers on this. In general, seizures would be manifest most often in childhood or at the latest in young adulthood. Um, that's true across all types of seizures, not just vein of Galen malformation. It's much more rare for an adult to develop seizures sort of out of the blue, um, although not impossible, but certainly the vast majority present in, in childhood. Awesome. So for the last question of the day, and again, we're always happy and available to answer any other questions if it's sent to us directly. Um, and uh, the question goes, what are the chances of future brain injury if the child was diagnosed prenatally, uh, received treatment postnatally without brain damage and has a vein of gallon malformation that's currently closed? That is a great question from someone who is pushing me to answer something that we don't have data on yet. Um, I'm going to say that intuitively and based on the patients we follow, um, it, it would be very rare uh, to see brain injury develop sort of out of the blue if you don't see flow in the malformation. So we, we do think that discrete sites of brain injury are related to the presence of flow in the malformation. Why there's brain injury is still a little bit the subject of debate. There are two main ideas about that. One is that something called arterial steel, which means that there's so much flow going to the malformation that the local arteries that should be feeding the brain tissue that's next to the malformation are not getting adequate flow. So it's a little bit like having ischemia where you're just not getting enough blood flow to the brain because so much is going to the malformation. That's called arterial steel. The other major theory is something called venous hypertension, which is that you're, you're directing high pressure blood from the artery into the venous system of the brain. And to function normally, the brain needs to have a low pressure venous system that it can drain its blood into. And all of a sudden you take that away because you have high pressure blood in there and that's no longer doable. So you're messing with the whole metabolism of the brain and that's why you get brain injuries. That, that question has not been decided yet. It's certainly possible that both of those mechanisms are involved, but both of those mechanisms would depend on there still being flow in the vein of Galen malformation. So if you don't see any flow, it's a little hard to imagine where the brain injuries would come from. Um, as I mentioned, that may not protect you from seizures or other issues that can be associated with, with uh, the, the same mutations, but brain injuries per se, I think would be pretty unexpected. Okay, I think we're going to wrap it up with that. I, I thank all of you for attending and for the fantastic questions. And um, as Jen and Christopher mentioned, we're certainly happy to take questions anytime by email or, or you can contact us by phone. Um, and um, take care, I wish all of you happy holidays.